We got Sean Knight from the band Childbite on the podcast. Sean is also the mastermind behind the Berserker Festival, as well as a visual artist extraordinaire doing all kinds of dark, impressive, uh, layered graphic design for his own recording projects, as well as other folks recording projects and, um, you know, large corporations trying to further the capitalist agenda and system. Um, he also recently put out a Samhain comp on which Like Rats had a song. And this uh, this compilation angered the man himself, Glenn E.D., but you know what? It's, it's out there. It's in the world. Everything is okay. And uh, there, there, there's vinyl records of this compilation that exists. So Sean and I talk about touring all the time, why he would subject himself to putting on a festival, and basically just how Sean has sacrificed his his soul and his mind at the the altar of extreme music for quite a while now. So check it out. But that most recent record is good. What is that thing called again? Oh, the, the most recent one is called Burnt Offerings, Burnt Offerings. and it's like, a, like rarities and covers. Oh, no, the, the full thing. length. Oh, the, fo- the most recent full length is called Negative Noise. Yeah, there we go. Cool. Yeah. Great. That thing's sweet. It sounds like the Jesus Lizard, which is cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're into that shit. Did you do that on purpose? Sound like the Jesus Lizard? Yeah. Uh, I think it's just one of our collective influences, so I okay. guess it's there. And uh, this would be sound very not very nice but i think i've found that like if david yao could be in a band as popular as jesus lizard and do what he does as a front man vocally that it then i i'm not as intimidated and it sounds like i'm just saying that he sucks and i don't think that's what it is i think it's just saying like oh you can be a total weirdo and not have like this super perfect voice and still have a whole bunch of people that are into what you do yeah i mean i think that there's always bands that manage to like whatever cross that line and kind of just be like okay this is who i am and this is what i do and for whatever reason it resonates with other freaks so have at it yeah yeah and then definitely uh, just a general uh bit of um advice and uh i think i think it's it's common it should be common knowledge but like having a unique sound a unique voice a unique characteristic to your to your music is so key and I think it's it's taken me time to really appreciate that because sometimes you're like oh when your band sounds different from a lot of other stuff you maybe I've been like self-conscious about it like well we don't really fit in with this or that and maybe we should try and like pick a side instead of just riding the line in yeah. between a bunch of stuff but then then after the afterwards you listen to a lot of bands are like oh, this band that sounds like 80s thrash metal and they sound exactly like Testament. Are, are people, when you start to think like further down the road as far as like, I'm going to my end of my days and what was my uh, you know, uh, impact on the world, I would rather not be like, oh yeah, he did this thing that was an exact copy of something <laughs> else. And like, yeah, that, that doesn't sound like as fulfilling and a, like a, just whatever, yeah. life goals type of deal. Well, I think that you, you touched on something interesting, which is that, I mean, a band like Child Bite is probably the odd band out at pretty much every show you play, right? Yeah, you're like, but it, it, we are, but it's also the, the the other side of that coin is that we get to tour with, like, hardcore bands or tour with metal bands or tour with, like, super weird bands. And uh, so, yeah, we're, like, kind of oddballs out, but then but we're able to fit in more. I think because we don't fit in, then we just kind of, based on energy and abrasiveness are kind of just like, oh, okay, they'll work with whatever that's also has those characteristics. Yeah, sure. So do you kind of get off on being like the most hardcore band at the noise rock show? <laughs> or like the most like weird band at the hardcore show or whatever? Uh, I don't, I just, I, I think it's just, it's just accepting what we are. And, yeah, yeah. and it's, I don't think at least for this band, I don't think we could force it to be, anything else so it's uh, I think uh, just becoming comfortable with that and looking at it as a positive instead of a negative and then yeah then, sure. then it's cool yeah so I mean I think that I probably uh, you know like will will enjoy being like the the most like alternative music fan at like a fitness event 
right? For sure. Where I'm for like, sure. oh yeah, like I'll definitely wear my like obituary shirt to this yeah. like CrossFit event to be like, uh-huh. oh, like fuck you, and yeah, then yeah, I'll yeah. like wear a fitness shirt to like a punk show and be like, dorks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you're yeah, it's it, the the whole thing of like wearing the shirt is like kind of like putting out a advertising a bit of your personality or something you're really into and so and when you do that especially when it stands out then you're quite possibly going to meet somebody else that's into that that you would have never known because they don't have uh they never would have thought to to do that or whatever you know you go to the metal show and everybody could be wearing an obituary shirt and it's kind of like duh okay yeah i like obituary too but uh but yeah if you go to your fitness thing wearing the obituary shirt you might have some like soccer mom looking person be like oh the incomplete is my favorite you're like oh yeah. wild i wouldn't we would have never had this conversation <laughs> yeah. otherwise yeah yeah well my favorite As is, like, my, my favorite is slowly we rot ma'am like please <laughs> <laughs> well she's a little older yeah, yeah. yeah I get it. <laughs> cool man so you are part of a a, a collective of detroit weirdos so t- take me back to the uh uh the beginnings of weird music in detroit Tell me, tell me about where all this came to be. I mean, as far as what this band, I mean, I was playing in a more like kind of indie rock band uh, and doing that and having a lot of fun. And then that started to fizzle out. And I was, there was a, there was a little bit of a kind of like a punk scene going on. Like almost more like dance punk at the time, really. This is like. 2005 ish like mid 2000s so like what like sounds like the rapture or something or? yeah there was a band uh, one of the main bands from detroit that was doing that stuff was called thunderbirds are now okay yeah I and remember they were that on band. like french kiss and yeah, yeah, yeah and uh yeah and so and like seeing them and like some uh, some of the other bands that are like because i was always into the weirder stuff i like i guess when you're talking about the shirts and, and whatnot at different things i was always like back when i was playing in this band new granada in the early 2000s I was always the Slayer shirt at the, you know, uh, whatever, Indie Rock Show. Indie Rock show. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so, I, and, but I also, whatever, grew up on the weirder shit like Mr. Bungle and Primus, at least weird for like mainstream weird or, or like well known weird, you know? I mean, I, w- I would agree that those bands, but even, even like, even in the overall whatever spectrum of weird bands, like those are two weird bands. Yeah. 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 And so I, and I guess I was always that. I was also that kid in high school listening to the Mr. Bungle tape in my car and my metal friends are like well, I don't know about this well Travolta that song's pretty heavy but I don't know about the circus crap or whatever you know whatever yeah. and um anyways it just when it was t- a becoming time for that band to r- slow down and then I but I had pretty much just got a taste of touring which is kind of weird I, I guess I, I felt like I was a little old for it like mid 20s just starting to do that where I feel like a lot of people were doing it quite a bit younger um i had kind of just got the taste for it. it's like oh, I, I i don't want to end my music career at 25 or whatever however old and, it was. and this was touring with your indie rock band yeah yeah, yeah. just doing a little diy thing what was the name of that band. again huh? what was the name of that it was band? called new granada cool which i think there was also a chicago band called new granada so that could be confusing but um anyways uh we uh i wanted to start something different and uh, found a couple other kind of weirdo dudes to try and start doing something and at that time our influence is more like like i said some of that kind of dance punky stuff but also like weirdos of the indie rock world at the time i'd say like deer hoof things like that where it's like kind of like that they they would play with those indie rock bands but they were definitely not normal it was just weird instrumentation weird sounds and all that um and and stuff like liars i think was kind of a big influence then like kind of heavy but kind of just like I, I don't have the right words for it but whatever the liars are those first couple of records which are even those are pretty different from each other um and then it's just kind of metamorphosized from there i think in the early days there was a couple of us really into metal stuff but and and hardcore and things like that but uh, but there was one key dude that was not into it, so that did make for some interesting stuff. Sorry. There we go. Thank you. Drink tickets. Drink tickets. Delicious. No, drink tickets are always worth the interruption. Delicious. <laughs> Thirst quenching drink tickets. <laughs> um, Delightful. But uh, no, 
in a way, it was cool having a guy in the band that was very counter to what the other guys like. That's very frustrating, but it's also a key thing for making keeping things interesting. Like, so if we try to have something that was more like this, like punk part, then he'd be playing this totally limp, weird, awkward <laughs> drum beat to it, you know, and it'd make like, it for <laughs> straight. <laughs> Have you seen uh, Have you seen some kind of monster? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you remember the part I where just like, like the drummer when he plays the beat? <laughs> Lars is playing that like super like awkward beat. Dude. Right. Yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> so every band practice was like that, where it's just yeah. some, like weird, like do, ka, do. It was definitely and yeah, like, like where where can I put the snare where it doesn't belong? Uh, and um, but then uh, then as time went on and a couple you know weird band members are changing, some people are. You know, moving on to other things in life, and other people are coming in. Then I think the uh, the Venn diagram of our influences started to include a lot more overlap of heavier stuff, be it noise rocky stuff or metal or hardcore. Um, uh, but always kind of retaining some of that that weird DNA of like uh, Devo. I'd say there's a lot of that in. Especially at the beginning, what we were doing, but there's still some of that. It's maybe not as uh, apparent now, but it's a lot of those kinds of ideas, uh, like like that, very, like very early Devo stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Because yeah. like those Devo, like whatever. The I don't remember what the collection of like singles and seven inches is called, but that's like an insane record. I'm trying to. I think it was just called like Hardcore Devo. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. And there was there was some really cool, interesting stuff in there. Yeah. yeah. So much so much output before even the stuff that they became known for and yeah i don't know which is kind of like even more impressive just them being a bunch of weirdos who are just like all right cool here's our like insane vision for our band and here you go enjoy these extremely bizarre songs yeah yeah. cool thanks no it's awesome i i nowadays i listen to that those songs more even more than like the first five records which i i love but yeah yeah so um I don't know. That kind of gets us to today, you know. Yeah. Well, so you, 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 I want to, I want to sort of dig into, to your background, I guess, you know, you mentioned in high school being like, were you, were you associated with metalheads? I mean, you, you said yeah. you were kind of like the, the guy listening to Mr. Uh, and I've with always the been, heads and. yeah. And I've always been the art guy too. Yeah. So I was already like the kid in the art class, but yeah, either wearing like the dead Kennedy shirt or metallic shirt. And, uh, and really I had like two different friends is, older siblings got me into the hardcore stuff like 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 either the misfits or like dead kennedys and black flag uh so you're like running. you're like playing at a friend's house and they're like check this out kids yeah yeah yeah, yeah. or something i think they just thought i was cooler than their little brother they'd be like hey, come here sean to come up here and check out this misfit seven inch or whatever um because i was already learning about metal from like headbangers ball at the time was the big thing and and like uh going down but you know when i was younger i'd ride my bike down to the liquor store to get my comic books and now i was oh metal maniacs what is this and checking that out so i was learning about metal plenty that way and and so many you know just it's the classic thing of like a lot of metal heads are like oh fuck punk it's just floppy bullshit or like the punk be like oh metal it's fucking you know uh but then really seeing like looking at a picture of Kerry King from Slayer and always having like that dead Kennedy sticker on his guitar, you know, or like obviously the garage days having those misfit songs, stuff like that. We were like, Oh, there is, there is overlap and there is a mutual respect for both of these. So I think early on I've got the idea like, you know, the diversity of it is cool. Being into just one thing is not necessarily as cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So you, um, what c- kind of get turned on to, like the 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 darker aspects of heavy music by friends, yeah, older siblings, yeah, and you're what kind of like sketching stuff all the time and totally, being, totally, you know, yeah, you like, like tracing album art and stuff. Yeah, like middle that. school, yeah. I'm just like drawing the pusshead skulls, you know. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, uh, I, I actually, <laughs> this is super funny. I, I remember like literally tracing bands logos like on tracing paper yeah and then my dad sold laminators like that was his business Uh so i had these like traced logos that i would then laminate like using our laminators at home and like tape on my notebooks at school like very (laughs) like like why did you laminate this dude what are you doing yeah it's 
protected, hey, man. Yeah, it's, I guess it's I, good. It's, I guess it worked <laughs> out. It's like it's like this like laminated skank and pickle logo. Like, what? What are you doing? It's pretty ridiculous. Yeah. It's funny how the <laughs> yeah. Trying to look back at how weird our minds are. Sure. So but, you are a man who does a lot of different stuff. I mean, you are in a band. You do art. You put together. Uh, records, you do a festival, all that kind of stuff. Um, have you always been someone who's like actually creating whatever like output and like putting it out for people to to experience, or is that something that you kind of like turned on later in life? I think it's always been, and I, I don't know what it is, like why it is, but it's always been like even from like very first punk band. Which, funny enough, we're on this tour with Unsane. My first punk band was called Insane, The Insane, and. Uh, very original. I yeah, love that. You know, it's like 14 year old kids, like, we're going to be called the insane. And it just, I'll draw all the tape cover. It'll be this guy in a straight jacket. It was just yeah. hilarious. But yeah, I was always kind of like, oh, I'll find out how to make tapes and I'll, we'll go to Kinko's or whatever and make the covers and, and I'll, whatever. So I think even from the, the very first things I was ever doing, I was like, oh, what can I do for the packaging and how can I get that, get it out? So I, I guess that's always been part of it. It hasn't been so much of like perfecting my craft and being in a band in a basement for two years before anybody hears a note. It was more like, I can barely play. Let's book a show. Yeah. And I don't know what that is, but it's like maybe some sort of exhibitionist thing or whatever. Or just like this need to, you know, perform. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it took me way too long to think of that word "perform." I was expecting a word. way cooler word to come out. Well, it's, it's hard to know if it starts with if it goes "pr" or "pe." You know, you just yeah. it's tricky. Yeah, it's a difficult word. Preform. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but but I um that I mean that's something I always think is super interesting is that a lot of people who you know grew up in this sort of punk culture just create stuff and like put it out, and that's always kind of been part of like what they've been doing. Um, and for a lot of other people, there's like a massive barrier to like actually creating something and like letting other people see it. Yeah, so, you yeah. know, just whatever that missing filter is or like a lack of regard for it is super interesting. It is interesting. And I think it's, yeah, of course, like whatever the, the final product is, maybe if it hasn't gone as through as many filters or been held back for a while, maybe it's going to be have more imperfections, which maybe makes it more interesting. Definitely, obviously not as polished, but possibly more interesting because it's just like this raw output <laughs> that just kind of blurted out of somebody it's kind of it is it is kind of interesting yeah yeah like like why <laughs> what 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 i mean because i feel like you know for me i was definitely someone who had a lot of i don't know like i don't want to say social anxiety because that's not the right word but like social miscalibration where i was like you know not totally comfortable socially in a lot of ways but i was totally comfortable like having a band and like playing or like making some stupid political zine and like passing it out in school. Like gotcha. that was totally fine for me. I gotcha. Yeah, no, that is interesting. It's something it's, it's less personal and it's, it's almost like putting on a, a mask or a costume or a uniform or something like I'm, Oh, I'm doing this specific thing as opposed to I'll just expose my inner feelings to you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's like, it yeah, two different yeah. Things. It'd be totally uncomfortable having like a conversation about like how my weekend was, but very comfortable. Like, writing like an embarrassing article with a lot of you know like teenage ideas in it and like read my article right <laughs> yeah. like what's what's why 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 is that okay for us yeah i don't know yeah we need a some sort of a professional uh shrink to uh be part of this in uh this little conversation to to answer those yeah. deep questions it's are you still living in like a, a weird traveling home <laughs> No, um, I do. We do still. My wife and I do still have our camper. Yeah. But um, we we found that, that it was awesome living in it for a couple of years and traveling and just uh, work doing freelance work for income. But neither of us really had a very strong uh, uh, source of uh, like steady income. You know, as freelance, it can be like hit or miss, and. Uh, we did, it just uh, it was there was too many like lean months where we're like oh man like it's hard to have fun when you're like afraid they're gonna come repo your car which is the thing that pulls your house lives. and then we're stuck yeah. in the middle of the hills of Tennessee somewhere um, so at the moment we're uh, we're working a regular job which is really cool there's a ad agency that we do all the stuff for Chevy because Detroit Motor City thing and. Uh, and so we're doing that. The idea is to eventually get back into it and living on wheels. And uh, 
but at the moment where it's more of a uh, putting away into the nest egg kind of making some thing. adult decisions yeah but at the same but here I am in the basement of a <laughs> dirty club <laughs> talking about dumb Punk. shit yeah and, yeah on tour but uh, so yeah it's, it's slightly adult sure yeah. moderately adult so yeah. so what's the deal you were on tour and you liked it so you're like why isn't my whole life just tour is that why you, you wanted to live in a and travel around or what's up well, kind of I think a little bit that my wife would be jealous that I'm getting to see a lot more of the world but then she would come on tour and she'd be like oh you're not really seeing anything other than the basements of dirty clubs and and and, and then people's you know whatever weirdos like floor that you're sleeping on and she's like no nah, you can keep doing that but um she was she got interested in the whole tiny house thing and so we were looking at that and but and I was I was interested and open to it but then I was also kind of like well, what if we did the same kind of thing, but to a camper that is kind of more designed to travel as opposed to the tiny houses is usually on wheels, but they are mentally be parked somewhere hooked up to things. I was like, what if we just had it on wheels and then we can go wherever we want? Uh, the key thing that we were doing was uh, the snowbird thing. Like so winter, the one year, one of the years we were doing it, we went down to Florida and South Carolina during like December, January and you being here in Chicago can probably see the the appeal of that kind of thing. I'm like driving down the street with the windows down to go pick up our pizza for dinner and in the middle of January, like this this is pretty cool, you know. Um so I hope we hope to get back there again. And then just do band stuff somewhat remotely and be like, All right, we have a tour, then I'll you know, I'll come home a week early and we'll do it. So I think it's cool. We just have to solidify the, the income to, to keep it moving which it seems like that's just the way things are going professionally anyways it's becoming more and more common for people to quote unquote work from home so if you can work from home then that means you can work from anywhere travel around in a tiny house you can work yeah. from your tiny house yeah exactly yeah yeah we could say we're working from home even though we're like on wherever the other side of the country yeah so what's your best tiny house story oh it's a high pressure question no i know um trying to think best or high quality <laughs> um oh uh, trying to think it mean, it's cool because like what we did was um with the camper we got a membership to a chain of campgrounds called thousand trails and they have them all over the country and so we would kind of just like use those as our little destinations or they are because because we had already paid for the year so it was kind of like all right that's makes it easy we could stay other places too but we have this already paid for so why not and there was one of the first times we were doing it, we were down in, uh, I think it was Diamond Caves or Mammoth Caves in uh, Kentucky somewhere. And we pulled in late at night, and we were still pretty new to the whole thing. It was real dark, showed up, whatever, like midnight. We're trying to, like, back up this, I think it's like a 38-foot trailer, and it's through these crazy hills. And we are finally, it's a little stressful. My dogs are, not my feet, but my actual dogs are barking, and... It's a this whole ridiculous scenario. Finally get it parked. You have to do all the stuff, plugging things in, stabilizers, unhooking things, whatever. And then I think we were like, let's, it'll be real nice to relax and we'll just like start a little bonfire and have some s'mores and whatever. And started that, started setting that up, not thinking about how it was this really windy night and we're out in this pretty wooded area and just like the flames start to spread and spread and I'm like, oh no and they were just like and there's like nobody around it's very desolate it was like it was like off season so there's like only three other campers and they're like half a mile away and i was just like buckets of water just like a hose ah, freaking out you know before we like burn down this entire campground That's so you managed to avoid a forest fire we did yeah that was the closest I was, closest i ever got to starting one and but yeah. luckily the, the ghost of Smokey the Bear with his <laughs> shining down upon me. Well, I mean, it could have been a firestorm to purify. Right. Sometimes it's a good thing. <laughs> Start over. Yeah. yeah. You know, you got to burn out the uh, burn out the underbrush and be good to go. Yeah. <laughs> it's all part of the the cycle of life. I know. Well, I didn't want I didn't want to see if that if they would be cool with that or not. <laughs> So the, the, the tiny house lifestyle uh, suits you? You like the yeah, kind of we were, whatever freedom? and Totally. And we were nervous about the small space thing, if that was going to be weird. Um, 
and I guess you don't know until you try it, you know. And uh, and it totally wasn't. It was totally fine. Our two dogs are pretty small, so that it wasn't really a problem. Um, yeah, it didn't. You know, we didn't. Some people were like, "Are you guys driving each other crazy, being in such a tight quarters?" And no, it's been good. And uh, and we similarly do this with the with our van for the band. We took out the back couple of benches and built in four quadrants that kind of like a sort of a morgue type situation you just kind of crawl into your slot yourself in yeah yeah you slide into your slot and uh and they're surprisingly comfortable and it works out really well for us at least for tour it's, we've all been like it was we we're nervous about doing it because we're like oh we're gonna spend some money putting this thing together and i don't know if it's gonna be a big waste of money and time and then we're just gonna put it back the way it was um but it's been awesome and i highly recommend it to bands because uh we now like when we're done playing a show we load up and then we start driving towards the next town and we'll get like an hour or so out of town and we just park with the trucks at like the the loves or the flying j or whatever truck stops and so you have a 24-hour bathroom there you have you could get a shower for 10 bucks if you want you can go and get a drink or a snack at any point in the night and you have your own little comfortable place to sleep and and that way when we wake up start driving we're already part of the way to the next destination no problem very efficient yeah yeah so when when you were traveling around how uh how did band stuff work i mean how, how did you actually i guess like write stuff for for a child bite or whatever oh like while i was like living yeah, yeah, away yeah. I, we're we're at a point where we're doing things very much like when when we're obviously it's time for a tour then we talk about what we what we're going to play for it everybody's boning up on the songs that we've chosen and then we get together for a couple days and just run through the set a bunch and then go and then we get home and might not see each other for a month and then we're like if we decide okay july we don't have much going on let's do some writing then we'll do the whole kind of like once or twice a week get together thing so how, how does writing work for you guys <coughs> So, I mean, I think that you have, um, I mean, like we talked about, kind of a an interesting sound, right? Where it's like, you know, kind of like weirdly chaotic and melodic riffing, um, you know, and, it, and it's, uh, I guess I'm just curious, like what the what the vision looks like for that and, and how you guys actually create those those songs. Yeah. Um, and that's changed over time with different people and, de- and just developing rapport with each other. But um, some of it, and historically, it was a lot more of the, get in a room together and look at each other and be like somebody do something <laughs> and then please yeah and then a very reactive kind of thing like if the drummer starts some sort of simple beat then somebody starts doing something else and somebody does something on top of that and then you're like oh what change this to match me whatever blah 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 and very organically grow from there or the other time it's uh it's somebody's got some you know people that work in different ways so sometimes i'll have like some riff ideas i I'm one of the people that just get my riff ideas in the bathroom, so I have to have like a re- recorder of some sort. Nowadays, just have it on my phone, but like yeah. back in the day, would have like a tape recorder sitting on top of the toilet, just just hum it in there in case some amazing riff comes to mind. I don't want to lose it, and um, and then I'll you know like so if it's me, I'll just come up with a couple riffs and like do some garbage drum machine on GarageBand and just throw it on real quick and rough to get the idea down but also to leave a lot of room for interpretation because nowadays I'm not even playing guitar in the band but I still want to contribute ideas you know so I'll, I'll give it to somebody else but I want them to be able to make it better you know and add their or make it more different or interesting so do you guys kind of like jam it out then is that sort of the process yeah yeah so yeah so it's either uh, bringing in like here's a rough demo here's a couple parts but always being totally open to change and uh or just yeah starting with nothing and having it be like super organic which is cool it's just like it's just not as good for being efficient with time because you might have one night that's a total bust like just nothing happened Nobody yeah you guys just all play inspired. crappy riffs and no one likes anything right right and then you're like well let's try again next so week. How, how does like veto power work because i'm always curious about that since almost every band i've ever been in has had one person who is like very clearly in charge, right? That it's like their creative vision and they're writing the bulk of the stuff and they're kind of like driving the song structure or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, And it sounds like, you know, for you guys, it's maybe a little more, uh, whatever, like democratic. So, you know, how, how, how does that work? I guess if, you know, someone doesn't like something or, um, 
you know, there, there's not necessarily like a clear push forward. How does that process end up shaking itself out? Yeah, I think that, um, there's a lot of times if somebody will start, like if somebody has an idea and the rest of us are just like, dude, I, I mean, if we just hate it, then we'll probably, <laughs> we would, I, that doesn't usually happen, but it, like, it, because I think we have enough overlap in interest that it's it's usually cool but sometimes somebody comes up with a riff and we're all kind of at a loss for it like, or, like for instance there's one song that we'll play tonight and uh, uh, called Stag Thrall and uh, Sean Clancy the bass player came to the band he was like I've got this idea it, like, it sounds kind of funky but it's like I want it to be more like a killing joke kind of thing so it's not like funky funky but it's it has a little bit of that but hearing just the bass part alone we couldn't help like the drummer just started playing like a chad smith beat to it we're like no no stop stop yeah, yeah. this is not going well yeah and then like, so, well, let's write an early 90s funk metal song right right and um so then we had to, we like something like that we had to really had just had to get creative think outside the box type of thing and be like so we started having him like break really all right remember your bass part the way that you want it to eventually be but can you play like a, a stripped down defunkified version of it and he, so he did that and then we're okay drummer play to that and then we'll come up with guitar and vocals of that and then once we figured out what we're doing then re you know bring that thing back in and we'll see if we've uh if we've counteracted the funkiness enough to make it interesting and tasteful, you know? Um, so yeah, I think it's just like some, you know, it really falls into, there's either, sometimes there's people have some ideas and it's just like a no brainer. It just comes together super easy. Or there's other ones where we just have to like work on it more. Uh, there was another one from that same recording session that the guitar player brought on, brought in. Then he was like, "Hey, I got this idea. It's a slide guitar thing." And we're like, "Oh, that's cool." But then it was, it was the same thing where, like, I'm pretty sure drummer started doing some sort of honky tonk thing. We're like, "No, no, no, like, come on, <laughs> let's go a little further, be a little more creative." And uh, and it was it was I, it was a very similar situation. And so it just like took a lot more work. And then, but then eventually we got it to a point where it did work and it sounded cool and not cheesy and sometimes that's the even the most interesting or the most uh um i don't know the most exciting or whatever kind of thing because it because of the work so there's almost like a collective understanding of like what the song needs to be like in order to be whatever done or what direction you're progressing in and you're just kind of like pulling pieces in and out trying to make it feel like you know you as a band sort of understand that feeling to be Yes, and I, I think, I think there's a, a mutual respect that if somebody's pushing hard for an idea, then we're gonna take the time to at least try to make it work. Because we're like, all right, they're not, you know, whatever, doing this to be a jerk or whatever, just to waste time or something. They must really have a vision, so let's try and help them find it. And if it works, then that's cool. Uh, yeah, but yeah, it, it tend, it, it's, it's. It's get, over time we our process has gotten better and better and uh and it just yeah just uh yeah we're just able to more quickly get to uh you know material that we're all happy with which is about to be tested because we're pretty soon we'll be starting to write new material with half of the band being different people so that's so Almost starting over, but I think Sean and I, being the guys that have been in the band pretty much the whole time, will be able to uh, we bring in the lessons that we've learned or the processes that we've kind of developed and get everybody up to speed real quick. Yeah, so you guys kind of have a structure already that you sort of use for like writing stuff. And yeah, just sort of and like, it, like, hey, earlier, earlier days, it was uh, we were more just like, let's do whatever and just whatever people come up with we'll do that and nowadays not that we're not open to exploring different stuff but it's more like we have a general idea what the voice of the band is like we we want it to be somewhat more focused um and kind of based on the stuff that we've done over the past few years so i think that helps you know having some parameters knowing that we can you can bring in this funky bass line or this slide guitar thing and We'll try and integrate that and keep on adding other elements into our like sound, but but uh, to not be like stagnant or, or repetitive or whatever. But uh, 
but at least have a general common goal. Yeah, so are the funky bass line and the slide guitar in the same song? They're two different songs. But they have I have an to idea be... for your band. What? I have an idea for your band. Okay. You should have the funky bass line and the slide guitar in the same song. What would Mr. Bungle do? Whoa, dude. <laughs> it's funny. We wrote those two songs <laughs> for a split EP with a Minneapolis band called Stunning, who are really awesome. It's S T N N N G. They're no longer a band, but they've been a band. They were a band for like 15 years. They had a really good run. And uh, very kind of Jesus Lizard meets Shellac kind of stuff. And, um, Awesome band, but uh, we were, we had to do this split with them because well, we wanted to do it, and we finally got around to writing these two songs for it. And uh, it's just kind of funny that those songs have those characteristics, and we ended up recording after we wrote them. We figured out who we were going to record them with, and it was Wes Borland from Limp Biscuit. Yeah, because, Detroit. Yeah, because he moved to Detroit, and we had a mutual friend, and I, whatever met him and said, "Hey, I know you got a studio. Would you be up for recording us?" And he was, it ended up being awesome. We figured, we figured if it, even if they turned out like crap, then he didn't know what he was doing. Then it was just a funny story. But it ended up being like one of the best recording sessions we've ever had. Like felt the most comfortable, sounded great right off the bat. And uh, yeah, he did an awesome job. So uh, I hope to do more with that. Yeah. That was cool. Yeah, let, let, let's talk about that. Where is his studio? Where is it? Is it it's actually, in his basement. So, so this got, is super funny. So my friend Bria got married in Detroit. Okay. Um, last what was it maybe october okay and actually the venue for the wedding was like literally across the street from west borland's house gotcha yeah. so at some point i'm pretty sure someone like went over and like knocked on the door to try to be like hey man like you should like come to the wedding or whatever but like of course this didn't work out but <laughs> it didn't work out. yeah <laughs> yeah um but yeah the heads up yeah yeah but it, you know it was, a, it was a valiant effort yeah yeah, yeah you know, totally. there were many many teenage former new metal fans at the uh, at the wedding, who were very like, oh, cool, like Wes Borland, yeah, 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 yeah. sick. Um, yeah, so tell me, tell me about recording with Wes. What 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 was the uh, I don't know the the best. We'll get, we'll do another best. What's the best thing that happened with that? Oh man, I'm trying to think. Did you guys listen to Big Dumb Face the whole time? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, he, he, he's like, all right, we're gonna get some like reference sounds here. So like, we'll just put on this Big Dumb Face record and like. Try to make yeah, it sound yeah, like just that. Yeah, just try and match yeah. the tones or something. No, I, I don't know. It was pretty normal. I don't know. I, I mean, he's just like a talented dude, and it's it, it's. I mean, I, in a way, it's unfortunate that his like name is associated with like pretty much like a punchline of a band. But 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 he's a great guitar player, and he's he's he's. A, we learned that he's a great engineer just because he's he was telling us about. It. He's like, yeah, I've been doing this stuff like for my own like personal stuff forever and every time he's gone into the studio with Limp Biscuit, he just uses that as a chance to it's like a lesson in recording he just like asks a million questions of whoever they're working with and like what is what what's the deal with that mic why are you doing this over here blah 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 and so he's just gathered all this information about recording I don't know. It's uh, it's cool. He was, um, it was just that he, him and his wife moved to town, and then they they were wanting to kind of get somewhat integrated into the local scene, and they went to a festival, which it's funny. It was happened to be kind of a competing festival to Berserkers, like this other kind of called the I think it was called the Hamtramck Music Fest, and it was happening the same weekend as our thing. He must have heard about that instead of ours. And so he you were super that. pissed. <laughs> and um. But he went and saw the band that he happened to go see is the perfect band for him to just walk into a venue and randomly see. Is this uh, buddies of ours called Golden Torso? And this is ridiculously like like awesome hardcore kind of band, but also just these very funny, great guys. They're, most of them are rather large and rather shirtless. <laughs> and uh, the singer Mike Durgan, who originally played drums in that Thunderbirds and Now band back in the day, and now he's the singer of a hardcore band. And uh, they're they're amazing, great great band in Detroit, and he fell in love with them, and they became good friends with those guys, and like had this the singer Mike Durgan at his wedding, and just they got in tight. And I would ask Durgan about Wes, like, oh, uh, what's the deal with him? And he was saying, oh yeah, he wants to record my band sometime. He's got the studio, and he's but he's never recorded like a full band live, and he wants to do that, and so we kind of be the guinea pigs. And so, like, oh, when are you gonna do it? He's like, oh, I don't know, sometime, or sometime in the future. So then I just kind of like 
circumvented that. Just yeah, just like, snuck in. Hey, how about you record my band instead? Or I was like, well, no, he's like, you can still record his band in the future, of course. But I was like, just knowing that he was open to that kind of thing and he was just looking for a guinea pig to be like, you know, I just hooked up way more chords than I usually do. Let's make sure everything works type of thing. Uh, so you're the actual like first band who he recorded. Yeah. Yeah. Sick. It's other than like his own bands where he'll just like record the drums, then record the guitar on top, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's actually, that's super cool. Like that's yeah. awesome. Right. I mean, uh, um, I mean, especially for a guy like that who, you know, I mean, Olympus could obviously with the budget to work with like the best of the best and just sort of be like, okay, how do you do that? Oh, why are you using that mic? Like, mm -hmm. why is that over there? Yeah. And it just like collect all that information and just be like, all right, sweet. I'm just going to do this now. That's super cool. Yeah. Yeah. So it was cool. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Nothing, nothing really. I don't, I don't remember if anything funny happened. He definitely had some self deprecating stories and, and was open to talking about the ridiculousness that is Limp Biscuit, you know? And, uh, I mean, more power to him. Like, they're at a point now that he doesn't, they don't have to tour. He just will like fly out and do some festival like four or five times a year. And that covers the yeah. cost of his mansion. Yeah. 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 It's, it's like, it's like, would you like to play this weekend for $1 million? You're like, yeah. Okay. Right. Like I, I can like be coaxed out of the house like four weekends of the month or the year. And yeah. Yeah. Totally. So so that's cool. Whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. So uh, you mentioned Berserker Fest. How long have you been doing that? What was that? Berserker. How long have you been doing it? This coming one will be Berserker 5. Nice. For the Roman numerally challenged. Yeah. We do go that route. Berserker so V. V behind the Berserker <laughs> this year. Like the, like the classic hardcore band Fury of V. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that was actually more, it was a, when I was starting it, it was even more so inspired by, like, WrestleManias. Okay, yeah. I was like, dude, I want to have those big Roman numerals <laughs> behind it eventually. That would be cool. Yeah, so I already had that kind of vision. Like, I, I knew, like, from starting Berserker, at least from the visual side, I was like, I want to come up with a type treatment and a color scheme and like a look for it that I'm happy with sticking to for years to come, you know? And I feel like it being a once a year thing, you can keep to that kind of strict guidelines or, or kind of like limited uh, art direction or whatever, because, because it's only something you see once a year. And, uh, so yeah, I had the coming up with the type the way I wanted it the first year. And then my whole idea and what I've have done since then is every year I'll like I'll kind of redraw the logo. Usually it's somewhat influenced by the headliner maybe, but or or just to mix it up. Um like when we had Guar, we had the, the it was super gooey. I think a lot before we had announced Guar, a lot of people were like, "Oh, we're this is gonna be like a bunch of like death metal and like you know, gore stuff." You know, it's all. I was like, "Well, sorry to disappoint you, but it's, it's Guar." Yeah. I was like, oh, that wasn't what I was wearing, but that's cool too. So whatever. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't remember where we were going with that. Well, I something that I think is interesting about that. I've never put on a festival myself, but. Um, seeing what goes into it having played several of them yeah uh, it seems like an insane thing to do so why yeah. would you do that yeah no it's yeah <laughs> it's like it's like uh, it, it is it sounds like a fun idea at first it's just not like oh it's just like i'm kind of making a mixtape and making it come to life for all my friends or whatever but there is so much that goes into it and depending on the, the scale, like a lot of money going into it. So just the stress of that, if it doesn't work out or if you build it and they don't come kind of thing. Um, so I don't, I don't know why we still do it every year. We question, Oh man, should we do this uh -oh, again? That, it's like, time. We spend like months getting ready for it and just like so endless hours. And I, I'm not sure there must be, I, I don't even think about it, but there's must be something sort of like being in a band and just like all the, terrible stuff that goes you know the, the bullshit involved with it either on the businessy side or just like being stuck in the van with people or being away from home for so long or money or whatever like there's obviously it's just same with bands there's just so many like negative parts that a lot of times you're like why am i doing this and i it must be there must, there must be enough redeeming things that i i keep coming back but it ends up being my wife is heavily involved with berserker ever since year two i think year one i just i had this vision and i was and it was small enough 
as far, it was mostly local bands and I was like I just want to do this I have this idea and I'm gonna just execute it and that way I know it, everything's done the way I want it to be done or whatever and if it fails then it's because my idea sucked or whatever um, and then, then then when it was time to start doing the next one she was like you know I can totally help and she's done a lot of like jobs like kind of like production manager type of stuff or, like office just jobs that like uh, in advertising and offices and she's like super organized and good at like kind of like dealing with all that kind of stuff or contacting vendors or or whatnot uh, whatever so so having her involved is cool takes some of the that off of my plate and uh ends up being a lot of fun for us to to work on it together and there's also and at this point there's other people that are part of the team as well um that work for the venue but they'll help us with like like their marketing team will help with certain stuff or the uh, promoters and, and everything so there's uh I don't know. It's it's a lot goes into it, and but yeah, like you said, it's sometimes you don't know why you're doing it, and every year we we question should we do this again, and uh, I think this year is gonna be the go go great. They they've all been really cool on certain levels, and they've all had certain things that didn't work, you know, and those are the ones that make us question it. And uh, I think this one is going to have the most success and the least amount of bummers. Um, and because every year we're like tweaking the formula, trying like, or should we do less days, more days, less locals, more locals, bigger bands, or smaller, you know, and uh, venues and trying to time of year there's so many different factors so we're always changing it to see what works but then it's also hard because there's so many different factors that you don't know why it works yeah. that it, one of them maybe we did it perfectly but because of the weather like year three which i think you guys played yeah. maybe um it was you know when we were doing it more more in like the winter time it was like maybe we did make something that was perfect that would have should have worked, but then well, the snowstorm it's happens, cold. and then people, like, like, people don't want to go out in a snowstorm, and maybe that was the reason. So maybe we changed stuff that didn't need to be. Uh, you could drive yourself crazy. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So uh, you, you try and follow your instincts and do what you think uh, you would enjoy. And you know, Veronica and I go to a lot of like other festivals, and just because we like that stuff, but also we can kind of like it gives us stuff to. It's almost like research for Berserker too, you know. Um, so we're just trying to make something that we would like, and if it resonates with other people, that's then it, then it's awesome. And if not, then we'll just we can be like, well, we're proud of what we accomplished, and you know, a lot of these things only last a certain number of years, anyways, because person only hates themselves enough to do it <laughs> a certain number of years. <laughs> I can't um, sign up to do this again. Yeah. So whatever. If if this is the end, number five is a good number, <laughs> nice round number. Berserker V. Yeah, yeah, Berserker V. You should have gotten Fury of V to play. Right. We should. Man, is it too late? I don't know. I don't know. Just reach out. Um, <laughs> well, so it sounds like it's it's really like a creative vision that you have in terms of, you know, wanting to see certain artists and like almost like a mixtape, like pair them with each other and sort of see what happens. So, you know, that, that the drive for you is maybe more that creative aspect of like creating the festival and that experience for people rather than necessarily like, you know, dealing with the whatever logistics of organizing it yeah totally and that's why it's so frustrating when you're like trying to book a thing and uh and just like bands can't do it you know you have like your wish list and oh it'd be so great if we need these bands and then they're like oh well we're supposed to be we're already booked to come to detroit two months later so that wouldn't work or your budget doesn't allow for what we would need or whatever reasons and so that uh can be frustrating but when it works out it is super cool like even this year just being like we had phil phil and some on the illegals booked as headliner so that was already nailed down and the way that it ended up working out, the two other main bands that'll be leading up to them on the main stage are Macabre and Negative Approach. And I feel like that, in a way, is almost the perfect kind of building up to to that because you got this like insanely fast, kind of like more death metal type of stuff, which I know all the dudes in his band are really excited about. Oh crap! We're playing macabre. That's awesome. And then, uh, and then Phil, like every other show he plays, has in a negative approach shirt. So I know he's happy to have them there. So it's, it was sometimes it's like it quite possibly wouldn't have gone that way. But luckily those bands were available, and 
and it's yeah just worked out yeah yeah negative approach is awesome too yeah like i saw them not that long ago and it was so good it's so good and they're they're just yeah still doing it and it's so great man we got to tour with them like two years ago because we were both of our us and negative approach were both playing uh, a festival in texas that and Selma was putting on called house core horror fest and so because we're us and negative approach we're both from detroit and we're both going to the same place we we're kind of like how about we do a tour together and um yeah so we got to watch them every night for three weeks and it was, it's, it's really awesome and uh very inspiring similarly with unsane guys that we get to go out these bands typically when we're going out like supporting a band like they're a bit older than us and seeing these guys and seeing them like these guys like unsane they're they're like i'm 40 and these guys are like between like 50 to the early 60s actually and watching them play a like 18 song like heavy like sweating like like grueling set night after night it's pretty pretty inspiring and it, it makes you feel like okay I, i'm not i've got i still have some miles left on me like if they can do it then then it doesn't mean like you know when you start to get like into the dark zone of like i don't know I should be doing this. What anymore. am I doing with my life? I, yeah, yeah. Should I quit this or whatever, whatever? Like, I don't know if anybody cares. Whatever. Um, knowing that, like, you can keep doing this stuff. And yeah, like John Brandon and those guys, like, it's just yeah, just awesome. Yeah, it's it's great seeing some like old timers show the the whippersnappers. Or here's how it's done. Yeah, I mean, like, Negative Approach is just like one of the hardest bands, like. Yeah. Ever like I mean obviously recorded but then live too it's just like whoa right is- right and then it, and that can a lot of times not be the case when a band's like whatever like thirty years later they're still doing it a lot of times it'd be kind of like a like oh they were still all right you know it was it was cool to hear those songs type of thing yeah. where but these couple of examples are not that at all you know they're kind of like oh dude they sound you know better than ever it's awesome yeah, yeah. and you like are like kind of afraid to be there you're like whoa man this is yeah, this is a dangerous show. Yeah, the cool. reaction that, that it evokes out of people, it's awesome. Yeah. So something I'm curious about with, like, festivals is, I mean, like you mentioned, there's so many moving parts. Like, how do you actually, um, you know, it seems like a, a constant chicken and egg situation where it's like, okay, well, you need to have bands booked that are going to make other bands want to play it, and then you need to have, like, some sort of traction to actually sell tickets, but you need to know how many tickets you're going to sell to actually like figure out how much you can pay people. Like, it just seems like, like an impossible thing where you're always trying to figure out, you know, you you need something done before you can actually do anything, but it's just like circular. How how the hell do you do it? Yeah. I don't know. You you, you just, you end up having like a general, like for us, we've come up with a budget and we know the capacity of our venue. And so, then the task is to find bands that like that all fit within that budget that are hopefully combined going to have a draw that will you know fill the venue or like, enough tickets uh, to do that it, and it is tricky because it's a, a lot of it's guesswork you can, I mean some stuff like a band that's been touring a bunch you can look at other numbers like look up like oh here's what they have pulled in the past in this town or this area or whatever and you get a general idea. Oh, this band's worth 200 people. This band's worth 400 people. There's, but then there's always going to be overlap. Of like maybe like 100 of those people are count for both or whatever. And um, I don't have it totally figured out. It's uh, And uh, it would be great to one day get to the point of like an MDF where the day after the festival would be like, here's the dates for next year. Like buy the tickets and people buy them like yeah, no just trusting right like the the promoters and the the brand or whatever um that's what we're trying to i think that'd be the goal and that's what we're trying to do is like have people trust us to like and and be able to start setting it up earlier we, we just have never been able to start that early because sometimes we're like not sure if we even want to do it again <laughs> you yeah. know and it takes us a couple months of uh recouping mentally and then we're like Oh, oh yeah, let the, maybe we should do it. Where we talk to the people and make sure that the money will be there, the dates and everything. Um, but yeah, so I think the I think we will do it next year again, and I think we will just get started right away. And I believe like it just takes time for these things to gain traction too. Like here we're at 
our fifth year and uh, year maybe year. enough maybe enough people have been or you know word of mouth and all that that uh that people will just be excited about it and and maybe next time we can be like hey here's the date in you know 11 months from now early bird tickets go on sale and we'll start telling your bands and and people will be like make it an event that people just want to go to no matter what they're like oh i know they'll have some cool bands there'll probably be some stuff that's not totally my thing but they'll definitely have stuff that i like and so i'm just gonna go because it's always a good time so trying to get there does it get less stressful every year because i know that like we run a competition at the gym that you know the first two times we did it i mean sort of like you said i was like fucked up for a while after it where i was like wow i just am completely burnt out and like can't think straight and need to like actually recover from doing that and i think the last time we did it i was like oh that was fine that wasn't yeah. that big of a deal because you, you just get better at it and you, yeah. of, and you know what to expect and you like you know the, totally. the major pitfalls you've handled preemptively so you're not just like uh oh like this thing is falling apart and I have to just like kill myself to save it right yeah because then because yeah you just learn over time and then like if something does start to fall apart you're like oh but I know how to deal with it because last time this happened and blah 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 um yeah I, I think it does it does get easier um yeah and I think the key will be trying to start earlier because you have this list of bands you want, and but if you're only starting to book it like three or four months in advance, yeah, they've already, already have the and, plan. Yeah, and it's that's where it just like gets so frustrating. You're like going down this list, just like I, I equate it to like a like job interviews. Like if you're like send out your resume to like 30 places, and immediately 20 of them say no, and you're like. Even if it's not personal, it's just like, well, we don't have an open position or you're not what we need right now or money's not right, whatever. It's still, it's it's not personal, but it's still kind of just defeating kind of feeling. You're just like, dude, like you're just getting knocked down. Like you're trying something and for whatever reason, it's not working out. <laughs> and uh, you have that happen enough times over and over and over is, uh, is a little exhausting. But then then you do get those little glimmers where like something does work out and you're like oh then then maybe it's even more relieving then because it took so much work to get to that yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah it's like i mean just like anything that you do where you're like trying to you know do something difficult you just fail repeatedly 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 and just having that whatever that muscle and that willpower and that experience to be like you know what like there's going to be something that actually works and i've done this before so i'm willing to kind of like suffer and handle you know the the what's what seems like failure to to get that one acceptance or whatever that you know you can then hang your hat on and kind of like build from there yeah totally totally man and i think it uh yeah and just uh, and and you if uh, yeah the first time through it's always trickier and you're like because you just don't even know what to expect maybe and so the defeats are harder to deal with because you haven't experienced overcoming those defeats or whatever so i think by the time it's like you know your fifth time doing it you're like kind of like all right i've been here done that like yeah this part sucks but i know there's a light at the end of the tunnel and uh yeah, it does. It does get better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it gets better. It gets better out there. So, what's up with the Samhain comp? Why did you do that? That was an Sawin. idea. I've had an idea for forever, and it was kind of like I've I've been like Misfits, Danzig, Samhain fan for since since those older siblings of my friends showed it to me when I was like thirteen or whatever. And um, for whatever reason, always I know his stuff isn't for everybody, but it struck a chord with me. And um. I remember thinking about years ago, thinking about tribute records and how they're like, they're cool, but they're kind of like self gratifying or whatever. In a way, no offense to anybody that puts something like that together, but and, and I'm somebody that did. But um, I think there's something also that is like tribute record. It makes sense. I'm trying the logic of it is like it makes sense to do a very popular band because. People will give a crap about it, and the band, other bands, will be excited because it's like, oh, that's something that like influenced all of us, and so we'll, yeah, we're happy to do our version of or whatever. And then people will actually buy the record because, hopefully, because they know that, and it'll be, oh, it'll be interesting to hear that done by different people. I kind of, but I, but you're never gonna like beat those original like like if you pick some like amazing band, you know, classic fucking, you know, like bulletproof band like there's no way 
these quote unquote air quote lesser bands are going to even get come close if at the best you could hope for is to be interesting or like yeah. oh that was something <laughs> you know or whatever it i think uh, and and i could totally be proven wrong and uh and uh i would love to be proven wrong but the idea with the samhain one was like this is a band that is well known enough and especially because of his other danzig's other bands it's well known enough but it's i felt like there was still like there's like albeit like enjoyable but there was a crudeness to like the recordings and the performances that yeah it's I, super raw yeah and I, I thought oh this like and and people know the band and you know some people love it some people are like oh that stuff's cool I'm more of a Misfits or Danzig but whatever so I thought that those those songs weren't on that same pedestal as whatever like if you're doing like like Nirvana tribute or whatever Metallica tribute or something like that you know where people are just gonna like judge it so harshly I was like all right this this might be that somewhere in the middle ground where like it's well known enough that we can sell 300 copies of it and people would be interested in it but it's not like the band isn't so beloved that like it will give it will give these covers like a fighting chance or somebody would be like it, it could be a tribute record and I think it is where a lot of people got it more so for the bands on it than the band we were covering but it wasn't like we were covering some like completely unknown band that only lasted for like from 82 to 84 and put out one record or whatever you know yeah uh so i was i thought it was like a kind of a it's like a sweet spice yeah for for a, for a tribute record so I, i've had this idea rattling around in my head for a dozen years or so and uh, i'm really glad i waited until now because now i'm at a, this point from doing the band and from doing the fest that i know enough like really cool bands that i was like all right if i again it's the mixtape thing i was like if i ask all these people this would be a cool mix that like not it's not like a total grab bag it's not going from like hip-hop to polka or something but like of like some well but what would mr bungle do what would <laughs> ww <laughs> and um but I, but it was so it's mo mostly on the heavy side because i think that uh, maybe i would assume most of the people that grew up on Danzig's music do heavy kind of stuff but then there's also kind of like some like electronic-y stuff and kind of more gothy stuff especially the last track this band Ritual Howls that closes it out because they were that was his kind of more kind of Bauhaus influenced kind of goth type band death rock thing um, so it was just something I, I just I don't know I had a vision for and then that sweet spot thing I was just couldn't have this nagging voice in the back of my head to put this thing together and when i finally like knew enough bands that i thought would be into it just decide do it you know um and I'm, I'm really proud of it it took a while to come out but it was also kind of and usually i'm very impatient about that stuff kind of like we were talking about at the very beginning like barely learn how to play guitar and put out let's a go. tape let's go yeah yeah let's, let's play a show tomorrow yeah. we don't have any songs no it doesn't matter yeah. you know uh usually i'm I think maybe with time or experience, I've gotten a little more patient, and uh, so uh, yeah. So I just, I just like, I, want, I was like, I want it to be right, so I'll take my time with it. And I even like was going to have somebody else do the artwork, and then that months later, that kind of fell through, and I'm kind of happy that it did because then I ended up doing what I did with the art myself, and I feel like is it was thematically fit really well, and. Uh, aesthetically it was the right choice for it um so yeah it, yeah it, it just it turned out real cool and all the bands being very uh like and nobody needed you know money to record there everybody was like into the idea enough to like contribute their time and, and whatever costs that were involved to do it and uh, it was just kind of it ended up for the most part being a feel-good thing until Danzig's lawyer sent us a letter <laughs> before before the record right right while the record I didn't even know passed. about this yeah and uh, because we finally got it, we we put a we uh, the we put a song on Decibel to help promote the the record and get pre orders going and it was a song by the man the band Midnight who uh, are kind of probably the the biggest band on on the record and uh, 
and they've toured with Sam Hain and it was super cool that they were like yeah let's do it you know and they sent me a song I was like oh crap I didn't think they would even do this and um, anyways so when we were promoting it then that's when it really made its way the the existence of this thing to Danzig and he unfortunately it seems like he kind of looked at this thing as a like almost like a bootleg. grab okay I see yeah it was kind of like I didn't know about this you guys are this is my music even though they're not my recordings but this is my mu- he's very everybody knows he's very protective like I've heard stories of him coming to Detroit back in the day like on a dancing tour or something going to the local record store this is like pre-internet so they would have all these like bootleg VHS tapes of like these like, crappy recordings of shows and he'd go in there with his like security guards and just scoop up all the stuff that was like Misfits or Danzig and walk out the door with it you know like I'm taking this stuff but all right kind of amazing you know and but yeah he's 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 notoriously protective of his stuff and I respect that um but unfortunately for him this time around we totally licensed the songs legally I sent mp3s of all the music and the entire plan for the record to his licensing person the person that represents him and said hey just want to make sure i'm doing everything by the books here's what we're doing and they gave us the thumbs up like yep yeah, no just go to this website and you can license the tunes and and then you're you're good so i had notified them did everything right paid the money and uh so then yeah they sent, they sent us a letter that was basically saying a, we yes, we licensed the songs for vinyl, but we did not license the songs for streaming. So that was a technicality, I guess, that like, oh, by us putting it on the Decibel site to promote it, we had, we weren't supposed to do that. But, but it didn't really like void anything out. They could just like, if they really want to, they'd be like, well, you have to pay us for that. And it's like probably $12 or something. It's, it's like a, whatever, like a fraction of a cent per stream or yeah. something, you know, like, and we, I would happily give him his twelve dollars, but they didn't ask for that. They were just—they were trying to use that as a way to scare us into not doing this, just because he felt like it was a violation or something, you know. Um, and then they said that the artwork was too similar, and people would be confused that it is the November Coming Fire record, which it, to me it looks like a tribute record, and we credited it on there, inspired by the da da da. You know, it's. Yes, it looks like an homage to that thing, but no, it does not look like that. It's that thing. Um, Although, so, as a child, I did accidentally purchase uh, the Longview single instead of the full album Dookie because I kind of didn't know what I was doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, this seems right. And yeah. I was like, why does it only have four songs? This sucks. <laughs> well, that, well, maybe maybe he was right. Maybe yeah. Danzig was right after all, and there's going to be some disappointed children out there buying <laughs> one of the 300 copies that was available yeah. of this record. Uh, so Danzig isn't going to play Berserker? So. What? Danzig isn't going to play Berserker then? Ah, uh, yeah. I don't. I, I think he's, I, he's probably not. Well, I... Honestly, if we were ever to try and book him for it, I would not tell him I'm the same guy that did this tribute record. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see. Maybe I'll maybe I'll take that as a challenge, and Berserker Bi will 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 we'll shoot for Danzig. I mean, get Sam Hain. There we go. It's a good Perfect. idea. Perfect. Let's and make then it I'll happen. have all the bands around the tribute record open the show. Yeah. Playing those songs. Yeah. It'd be like. What's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because obviously he'd be standing out in the crowd the entire night watching right. every single band. You know, exactly. Of course. Exactly. That sounds to me like some extreme performance art that right. you should definitely make happen. Years in the making. Yeah. For a joke just I will, you and I will think is funny. Yeah. 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 It's like, oh, it's, it's, it's happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here yeah. we go. Poor dancing. Oh, yeah. um, Andy great. Kaufman level stuff. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, Sean... Um, What's what's if someone wants to listen to Child Bite, what should they do? We're pretty much all the usual places, uh, as far as your Spotify's or your Pandora's or your iTunes, and uh, we do have ChildBite.com. For some reason, that wasn't already taken, and uh, yeah, there's links to everything there. A lot of stuff on YouTube. We got what some- record should they listen to? <laughs> The latest full length is called Negative Noise. That come out came out. I roughly. recommend it. What was that? I recommend it. That oh, one. okay, cool. I'm happy with it too. It came out roughly two years ago. Um, that was the one that we recorded down at Ensemble's place, 
and he produced it and everything. And uh, so that that one would be, you know, we're still like playing half of our set as tunes tunes from that. So uh, that yeah, yeah. so that, I mean that's a good one. And uh, other than that, we just put out this burnt offerings record that uh, is rarities and covers from the past like seven or eight years and I know that's typically not what somebody would be like oh I gotta check this out that sounds like the oh that's the extra stuff but I would say some of it is some of our strongest stuff because these are songs that we did in like small batches so it'd be like instead of going to the studio to record 13 songs we're going in there to record two songs and so all of our attention and creative juices were maximized focused yeah yeah so so some of that stuff and that's kind of why i put wanted this thing to come out because a lot of it all uh, the stuff either is either unreleased stuff or stuff that was on like limited vinyl which is long gone and so it, and it's like oh it feels weird that these songs i mean obviously now with the internet nothing's ever truly lost or dead but it felt person on a personal level felt nice to have uh, a packaged collection of wrapping up all these loose ends and little hidden gems and if someone wants to go to berserker fest when is it who's yeah. playing well berserker goes down september 28th in pontiac michigan uh half hour north of detroit and uh yeah it's a friday night and then we're uh the, the night before the thursday night which would be the 27th for those of you who have trouble with math um we're gonna be doing a, a pre-zerker kind of kickoff show and uh, we haven't announced it yet, but uh, I'll say it here first is that we're going to have the band Midnight that we were just talking about. They're going to headline it. Um, they're from Cleveland area on the Hell's Headbangers label, which is really rad stuff. And the band that's playing right before them is also a Hell's Headbangers band called Shed the Skin, which is great stuff. It's members of Incantation and Ringworm, which is quite the combo. Is it Kyle from Incantation? It's Kyle from Incantation. I mustache heard, and toe. I heard, I heard he has a mustache. <laughs> and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so so we're going to be having that as the the kickoff. So then, so it is going to be like a kind of a two night you know thing. And I think, and, I think and it's it, me worthwhile. I think it's me a lot of fun. And who's playing the True Berserker? We talked about it a little bit. We got yeah, Philip um, Anselmo. Philip Anselmo's and headlining it. Uh, Negative Approach is playing. Macabre. Uh, other Detroit bands. We have uh, a band called Battlecross. Um, which we're buddies with, and is for some reason is the first time we're having them on it. Uh, from Australia, with King Parrot, uh, they're great guys and ridiculous and amazing people. Um, band Tombs is playing. Band Homewrecker, uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of really good stuff. Yeah, all packed in. And it's like the way we do Berserker for people that haven't been there is it's a three stages within a building situation. So we'll have like 14, 15 bands playing from like 6 p.m. until midnight, which on paper sounds like a lot to take in. Like, I, I mean, myself, I'm sure a lot of people like go to a show and if there's like more than three bands, you're kind of just like, oh, geez, all right, there's a lot. To, but I think because it's so much and it's in these different rooms, you spend the whole night like running around, like catching like 10 minutes of this and 20 minutes of that grab a drink, go to the bathroom, go smoke or whatever, blah, 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 grab a bite to eat and keep doing this rotation. And before you know it, you're like, the night's over. And it's almost like this whirlwind that, like, holy crap, it didn't, it, it felt crazy, but it wasn't, it's almost not exhausting because it's just, like, exciting uh, to see that many bands in, in one place. Yeah, you get, to, you get to do the rotations and check yeah. them all out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, and it's the kind of thing where it's like you go into one room and check out a band out of curiosity or whatever, hear a song, maybe it's not your thing, there's a, there's something happening right now in the other room, and there's another band queued up to start 15 minutes from now in the third room. So there's, not even if it, not everything's somebody's bag, there's plenty of other stuff to, to check out. There you go. The, the Berserker Fest is your oyster. Yeah. Make of it what you will. Yeah. Crack that son of a gun open. Yeah. <laughs> Pop it open. <laughs> Pop open a berserker. Yeah. <laughs> Get a pearl. Thanks for listening all the way through. 
I admire your grit, your persistence, and your perseverance. Since you made it, I have a few favors to ask of you. Go ahead, open up the show notes on whatever podcast player you use. And there you'll find links to all the resources that were mentioned throughout the show. There's also some links there in which you can leave a review or subscribe to the show. And podcasters are always harping on this because this actually makes a difference in terms of the algorithms that recommend podcasts to new people. So if you do that, it helps more people find the show. And if you head over to toddneef.com, you can sign up to receive most of my thoughts and writing, which really only go out to the email list. A lot of it never makes it to the blog or the podcast. So if you like what I have to say and you want to see some of my recommendations and stuff that I've been checking out, go ahead and subscribe to that email newsletter as well.